Hello, I'm Juliet Maxim. And I'm Lucy Wright, and this is Life on Rails. We both work at Greater Anglia, which means that we're able to go behind the scenes at one of the UK's biggest train companies. And in this podcast, we'll be talking to drivers, managers, cleaners, and everyone in between, including some of the celebs of East Anglia and the train world. We've got a great first episode lined up. Join us as we speak to our resident fares guru, Ken Strong. Especially on lightly loaded trains where the number of tickets sold is not generally that high, there will still be fairly cheap fares available and it will still work out a lot cheaper. Environment manager Steph Evans. There's a lot of stories at the moment on like things we can do and I think if everyone does their own little bit then we can all help to make a difference. Nadia O'Brien who's in charge of train cleaning. The train still needed to be cleaned and during the pandemic it needed to be cleaned even more so. Even when we had calls of people going into self-isolation or COVID symptoms. The team then shrunk down a little bit, but they worked even harder. And Steve Mitchell, project manager on the biggest new trains order in UK history. I mean, if we look at the date that some of those trains were built back in the mid seventies, and you looked at the cars on the road at the time, if we're all still driving around in those cars, we'd all want to change. To kick things off though, we're going to chat with Jeff Marshall, one of the biggest transport YouTubers around. This is Travel Surgery, where Lucy and I choose a destination on our network for a special guest. Today, we're joined by video editor and producer Jeff Marshall. He's been in the Guinness World Book of Records twice for travelling to all of the London underground stations in the fastest time possible. And in 2017, he visited all 2,563 national rail stations in Great Britain, including the best those at Greater Anglia. Hi Jeff, thanks for coming on our podcast and being one of our first guests. Hello, thanks for having me, nice to be here. Can you just explain a bit about your job just for anyone who doesn't know what you do? Well as, as a middle-aged man in his 40s I, uh, I'm reticent towards using the phrase YouTuber because for that you have to be half my age to sat in your bedroom and I do venture out mainly onto the railway network with my video camera and uh, proceed to sort of create short films, entertaining videos Vlogs, as I believe, sometimes is the, is the phrase used to just sort of highlight transport and stations and and uh, and, uh, and travel around Britain and sometimes outside of Britain as well. We, we love your videos, of course. Why the railway? When did you first become interested in the railway? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I always remember my my granddad. He'd have a bookshelf full of maps, OS maps and just like an A to Z collection going back many years. And on the back of every London A to Z was always a copy of that year's edition's tube map. And as a small boy, I would always look at the tube map and sort of notice the differences over time and how things have grown and changed. And I took an interest in thinking, you know, what is at the end of the lines? What is at Upminster? And what is at Epping? And, and, that, and I think that kind of stayed with me. I became a young adult with a natural job and natural money. I remember that there was all those places from years ago and it was time to sort of head out and explore the network. How did you cope over the past year or so? I mean, the pandemic at the start, it was essential travel only. How did you cope? I did a whole bunch of walking videos. I went and did a whole series of walking old, abandoned and disused railways around London. I did a series of 16 videos, which uh, which kept me very occupied for, for two months during sort of January, February, March, April time. And then sort of from March, April this year onwards, things have sort of slowly returned a little bit back to normal. So you enjoy walking. That's an interesting thing to know. So what what does the railway mean to you? The story I always like to tell is of my friend Roland. I used to work with many years ago. I used to work at the BBC and we, we did that Monday to Friday office job. And he was from Newcastle. He was down in London and he spent five years down here. And he got the tube every day, I think two stops from the end of the Northern Line, Collier's Wood, up into central London. And when it got to his last week and he was leaving to go back up Newcastle, he got married and went home and stuff. And he was like, yeah, I had to get that, you know, that Northern Line train every, every blooming day. And I was like, well, at least you got to see like the sunny sights of Morden. I said rather flippantly, because in Morden, it's just like a supermarket. And he was like, you said, you know what, Jeff, in all the five years I've been doing it, I've never actually sort of gone two stops south and gone to Morden. And I was like, what? Did you ever just get the urge to stay on the train one evening? and just see what was beyond your stop and he went no and I was like I was aghast people just get stuck in that world of like I'll get on at my home station and I go to this station and that's it and and I just have this bug inside of me that says no well why don't you just go a stop further or why not get out at a different stop so be less Roland be more Jeff go out and have an adventure What's it like sharing your journeys with the world what kind of feedback do you get have you inspired people to 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 get out and see more not just Roland it's strange like occasionally I get like a, a tweet or, or an email I think my favorite recently was I did that I was just I did that whole Lost Railways series 
beginning of this year, like episode five, I was uh, you walked across Staines Moor in southwest London to follow the path of the old railway there. And I got this hilarious message saying, Jeff, just to let you know, I'm a 38 year old with a four year old son. And he insisted, insisted that we went to Staines Moor last, last Saturday and I had to walk across and I wish I'd taken my Wellington boots. So, you know, it's nice when people see you do something and then and then they go and do the same thing which which is something that I do as well because I I watch other people so I'm genuinely inspired myself and then that inspiration is sort of passed on to others as well and that's the purpose of this interview we want to inspire you yes you've been to all of our stations but we want to inspire you to go beyond the station we just want to find out what would be the perfect destination for you so you clearly like walking you like going by train our community rail partnerships publish booklets of walks and i've been trying them out because i love going by train and i love walking and there's one i think might be right up your street if you're not scared of walking, you know, maybe 10 miles. Is that too much? 10, 12, 12 miles? I, I like to get in my 10,000 steps a day anyway. That's kind of always a, like, so that's, that's about 5k. This would be perfect then. So it's the Deben and Coast Walk and it's in the East Suffolk Line Walks booklet. And it's basically between Trimley and Felixstowe stations, but it's not direct. It takes you across some marshes and then along the River Deben and along the coast. And some of it is really empty. You can see nobody. And then you get to Felixstowe Ferry and into Felixstowe. So there we are. I think that is the, the perfect little trip for you to make. And I just recommend to you getting the Community Rail Partnership booklets and then they'll tell you about the different sites along the way. That's it. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Is this the first ever one? It is the first ever one. You're our first ever travel surgery guest and we really hope you enjoy our recommendation to you. Thank you. All right, Juliet, Lucy, thank you. So we're on location today. We're at Norwich. We're at Norwich Station and we're recording today with Nadia O'Brien, who's our presentation ops manager. Hi, Nadia. Thanks for being on our podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So can you just talk me through your role, what it is you do, where you're based that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. So I'm based out of Norwich Station and I work with the presentation team cleaning the trains out of sort of, like I said, Norwich, also Crown Point Depot, uh, also Ipswich, Clacton, Colchester and also Harwich International as well. So a typical day is the train will come into Norwich, the guys are ready to get on the train, clean. So we litter pick, make sure the soap in the toilet is completely full also make sure there's toilet roll and a spare and just make sure everything is clean and tidy and then during the night we do more of a enhanced clean so we do a stabled clean as we call it which is more of an in-depth clean than a sort of you know half an hour turnaround clean where we go through we mop hoover sort of inside out and also we carpet clean as well so the trains overnight i've got their carpets all cleaned so over the pandemic, we have invested over half a million pounds in some of the new equipment, um, the fogging guns, the ATP machines and so on, the backpack vacs. Have they been well received? Do people like using them? Oh, massively, yeah. The whole teams, they've just really just stuck in and got on with it. And also we've had sort of people going, oh, I want to do that job. Because it's also something different. It It's changed their routine up a little bit. So they are very interested and very well received equipment. We're now going to look at how a fogging gun works. So what's the, what's the point of a fogging gun, Nadia? Okay, so the fogging gun produces a very fine mist of a chemical and it will sort of sanitise in the nooks and crannies that the cleaners can't actually get to and it will kill bacteria and it will remain there for a while and, yeah, it's a lot safer and cleaner than just going in and cleaning with a chemical and a microfiber cloth which we do both but just double protection and i can see that we've got we've got a fogging gun with us yes we have in the room where we're recording so would you like to just show me how it works of course yeah so you've got a small tank that uh, sits on the bottom and you put your chemical in the small tank screw it on and then just press a button and the fine mist will come out so if i just screw that on there and then all you do is press a button 
and then it just sprays a fine mist everywhere and as you can see it sort of goes quite far and we also invested in pack vacs the backpack vacuum cleaners they they're quite handy aren't they because they're quite lightweight but they mm-hmm. don't only clean the floors no so they actually clean the air whilst we are hoovering as well oh should we have a look at one yes definitely so these are worn literally like a backpack yes yeah so worn on your back so there's no sort of lifting up a hoover and sort of you know trying to carry that down the aisle they just wear it on their back looking like a ghostbuster and then yeah just hoovering so it's a lot easier um they're really light as well and also you can take off the end as well so you can just take it off if you see something on a chair you can just hoover it up quickly okay like so and they and they filter the air as well so they do filter the air let's have a look okay excellent <laughs> So just going back, it's been a a strange 18 months, as we've all talked about. But at the start of the pandemic, we were still running a service for key workers. So and our our staff themselves were were key workers. So what what happened there? So like you say, obviously, we were running a service, the train still needed to be cleaned. And during the pandemic, it needed to be cleaned even more so. So the team, they weren't followed, they came in you know, every single shift during the night, during the day. And obviously COVID affected everybody. So it also affected our workforce or the colleagues downstairs and in their personal lives as well. Even when we had calls of people going into self-isolation or COVID symptoms, the team then shrunk down a little bit, but they worked even harder. They completely went above and beyond. They did. We received so many nice tweets as well. So Thank you. If you're one of the customers who sent one of those lovely tweets about our team, they do get they do get passed on. And just want to say a huge thank you to you, your team, your colleagues, and the wider colleagues across the network because it has been a, a really really difficult job. So thank you to to them and to you. It's, thank you um, very much. Thank you. Everyone's pulled together and worked as a team throughout the pandemic, which has just been fantastic. So thank you. Back in October 2016, Greater Anglia ordered a fleet of 191 new trains, the biggest whole-scale replacement of new trains in franchising history. Today I'm sitting down with Steve Mitchell, project manager for the new trains programme for part of it, to discuss how the project is going. So, Steve, hello. Hello, Juliet. Tell me about your involvement in, in getting new trains. So my involvement was as the joint project manager for the Stadler fleet of trains, which is 58 of those uh, new trains that you've mentioned. Uh, That's part of the wider new trains program, which is about changing every single train that Greater Anglia uh, was operating. Why did we do it? What was wrong with our old trains? All the train enthusiasts love them. They've served us well for a very long time, but they're dated I mean, if we look at the date that some of those trains were built back in the mid 70s and you looked at the cars on the road at the time, if we're all still driving around in those cars, we would all want to have modern facilities. Uh, And in fact, the Stadler fleet, which I was fortuitous enough to be involved in buying, is probably one of the significant steps forward in that uh, that the UK's had in a long time. The height of the train compared to the platforms has been altered. There's not this automatic big step up that our old trains used to have and now we even have a ramp that comes out to bridge that gap to make it easier to get on and off yeah they are absolutely brilliant i love those trains look it was um 2016 when we put in the order for those trains all the ones that you were responsible for the stadlers are now in but we're still waiting for the rest of the trains to come that they are trickling in why on earth does it take so long again i'll use another analogy to the car industry and uh, actually people might see that they order their car and perhaps with a bit of a chip shortage at the moment that still might take three four months to get your car with a train it's a bit different that train is bespoke to the region so we go through a design cycle and therefore The train has been effectively custom adapted and designed for our particular railway. That takes time 
because you've got to get that right. There's a large element of chains which are actually handmade, aren't they? It really isn't like a, a car rolling off a production line. Yeah, very much so. Uh, the, 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 the actual chassis itself is uh, what they call a monocoque chassis. Uh, it is aluminium welded together by very skilled welders that uh, actually build that structure. And then once that structure is built, the rest of the train is then built around that chassis. Every wire, every part is hand assembled. Where, where were these trains made? The trains were made all over Europe. The actual assembly of the trains took place in three main locations. Switzerland, where Stadler come from, in a place called Busnang. In Poland, a place called Chilitza. And in Valencia, in Spain. But the parts of the train that then go into the assembly come from lots of different countries. The camera system comes from a company called Petard, based in Newcastle. The pantographs on the roof come from a company called Brecknell Willis, based in Somerset. The door system comes from Austria, and from a company in Austria. And the body shells themselves, some of them were actually made in Switzerland. Some of them were made in Hungary, in a place called Solnok. That's incredible. What's so good about these new trains? That's a really hard question, just to pick one thing. I, I mean... They're uh, faster accelerating, they help keep better time for our passengers. They're lighter, uh, they're aluminium made trains, so they use less electricity to get from London to Norwich or London to Stansted. And our bi-mode trains take full advantage of when they're underneath the pantograph, the wires, they can run on electric rather than using diesel. So they're actually got an environmental benefit as well. Whichever way we look at it, I think they're a significant improvement on what we've had before. And I was so very you know, personally involved. I'm really proud. Shortly after the new trains came into service, I took my family to go and see a new train. We travelled from uh, Norwich to Yarmouth. And as part of that trip, we saw the train in action. We saw the air conditioning, the space, the passenger information. And then at Yarmouth, we saw two wheelchair users self-board onto the train as well and take advantage of the low floor. We travelled back to Norwich and having experienced that new train, we decided to go for some fish and chips in Cromer. And of course, at the time, it was one of those one carriage trains, 153 as we call it, and it was packed. It was hot. It was, yeah, quite quite unpleasant. And actually, it was really, really good to realise that the change was coming and that that will be a thing of the past. And it is now a thing of the past for our rural routes because we've changed all of those trains. Oh, that's just brilliant. A great story to end on. So thanks very much, Steve. Thanks for being a guest on this podcast. And thanks for all your hard work on getting us new trains. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Juliet. In every episode, we'll dive into some seasonal mythbusters to get to the bottom of how the weather really impacts train travel. Autumn's coming up, and what sort of challenges do you think that's likely to bring? Lucy, traditionally in autumn, the railway is pilloried and laughed at for leaves on the line. But we know leaves on the line are no joke. Leaves on the line are the equivalent of black ice on the roads. Leaves fall off the trees and they get compacted into this big slippery mess on the rails. And the worst case scenario, it causes the train wheels to either spin when the trains are accelerating or lock when the trains are breaking and we're working really hard with Network Rail, the people who run the signals, the tracks, the overhead lines, to really keep on top of autumn and the problems that it brings. Our trains have this fantastic new technology and for for all the engineers out there, we've got wheel slide protection, which is like ABS on cars, and that stops the train wheels from locking and skidding. And we've got this thing called, on our new trains this is, called dynamic traction control, which stops the train wheels from spinning when when they're accelerating. And do you know what else we've got on our trains? This is really quite incredible. We have sand stored on the train and the drivers, if they feel that the track's getting a little bit slippery or they look out the window and they see that conditions look bad, they can release the sand onto the tracks and that gives them more grip as well. Just imagine if you had cars with grit on board and you could release grit whenever you're on black ice, but we've got it on our trains. Just incredible. So that's everything that we're doing on the new trains, which sounds brilliant, but obviously we don't manage and maintain the track. So what are our colleagues at Network Rail doing this autumn? Autumn is a big time of year for Network Rail. You're quite right. They have these special trains. They're called railhead treatment trains, and they go around the network 
blasting the leaves off the tracks and then they put this special gel on the tracks which helps the train wheels grip the track it's like gritting again and they apparently at network rail they have all of this intelligence about the network they monitor the leaves and the vegetation they do chop some of it down in an environmentally friendly way obviously but they send the railhead treatment trains to the areas which are worst affected by falling leaves and there's lots of new technology coming up which is being trialled in other parts of the country because the railway as a whole not just at Greater Anglia we are determined to make our railway as punctual as possible because we know that's what our customers want and last autumn which was the first autumn where we had more new trains was was just incredible punctuality was great and we're really hoping to do the same this year oh and I must remind everybody to check before they travel because the other thing we do is we retime six of our early morning intercity services they're just a few minutes earlier and that's just to give ourselves a little bit of extra leeway to avoid delays so as ever check before you travel and is there anything that you'd recommend passengers doing in east anglia in autumn we have got some really great places to go on our network where you can admire the changing colors of the leaves on the trees before they fall thetford forest that's nearby. Do you know Christchurch Park in Ipswich? That is such a beautiful park and they have some magnificent trees there. Also Cambridge Botanical Gardens, they're beautiful all year round but autumn it is magnificent isn't it? Red, gold, yellow, the leaves do look wonderful. I love this time of year. Okay, Lucy, thanks for the grilling. It's your turn next time. It certainly is. In our next episode, we'll be talking about winter weather. So if you've got any questions about snow, winter travel, anything like that, please do get in touch. You can send us a tweet at Greater Anglia PR. We'll be answering some of your questions about winter weather and snow in our next episode. Just a reminder that the autumn timetable is now underway, so please do check before you travel. Just some of the earlier intercity services are slightly (laughs) re-timed. now joined by Ken Strong, Greater Anglia's resident fares guru. Hi Ken, thanks for coming on our podcast. Hi Lucy, thanks very much for inviting me. Ken, could you just describe your role to us please? Well I'm basically the pricing analyst and I work to the actual pricing manager but I do the sort of day-to-day nitty-gritty of fares and I also sort out reservations and quota management for the cheap advance fares. I think it's important just to say now that Ken doesn't decide every single fair in Greater Anglia. A lot of fairs are regulated by the government. We don't set all of our fares. So if you're thinking, why does my fare cost this? It's not Ken's fault. Ken doesn't make all those decisions. So Ken, today we are going to be talking about advanced fares. Can you just explain what these are to anyone who doesn't know? Well, advanced fares are by their name. You have to book them in advance and they are specific to a particular train. You have to travel on the train that you're booked on, but that is why they are cheaper by and large than tickets that you might buy on the day that are more flexible. So it's a good value fare, quite cheap comparatively and valid for a specific train. So how far in advance can people book these cheaper fares? Normally the booking horizon, as we call it, is 12 weeks before departure of the train. But currently because of various COVID timetable amendments that we've been putting in and the timetable has been changing, It's about six weeks. We're hoping to extend that over the next year or so back up to the 12 weeks. But basically, as soon as they become available, the sooner you book, the cheaper you'll get a ticket. And what type of journeys can people get an advance fare for? Because it's not just sort of the longer journeys that we run. It's not just Norwich to London, is it? It's not just Norwich to London. You can get a shorter journey as Colchester to London. And on our West Anglia route, you can get from Audley End and Stansted Mount Fitch and various places between Cambridge and London. And you can also book them to non-London places. You don't have to be going to or from London. You can buy them from Colchester to Great Yarmouth, or you can buy them, indeed, across the country to wherever you're going off the GA network. What about the best times to travel? Are there quieter times, any time of day that people might be able to get a slightly cheaper ticket? Mid-morning, late morning, early afternoon. Trains are quite quiet, and we can put on quite a few cheap tickets to fill up the train. And then, of course, as the afternoon goes on, Leaving London in particular, we uh, reduce the numbers that are available. Going towards London in the afternoon isn't a problem because the trains are quiet. We keep them on there. And then in the evenings, again, they, they become available. And so we know that the cheapest way to travel is to buy tickets in advance. How can people sign up for alerts or know when the cheapest fares are available? 
Well, on the GA website, you can sign up to advance ticket alerts where the cheap fares, as soon as they're released, you will get an email to advise you that the fares for the particular day that you want to travel have been released. And then you can jump in and get them before anybody else does. Brilliant. And if somebody does forget or it slips their mind at all, how far in advance can people book? I mean, is there any benefit in just booking in advance, you know, three days before travel, for example? Oh, absolutely. Especially on lightly loaded trains where the number of tickets sold is not generally that high. There will still be maybe not the very cheapest level, but there will still be fairly cheap fares available. And it's, it'll still work out a lot cheaper than buying on the day tickets. One bit of advice I do have is if you're making a return journey, put in both ways at the one time when you're doing a search. And then if the on the day return ticket is cheaper, it will show that on your results and you can buy the off peak return, which isn't specific to a particular train. Most of the time, advance will still be cheaper, but there are some cases, especially on slightly busier trains, mid morning or late ish afternoon, where the off peak ticket may work out cheaper. So that's a tip that you can bear in mind. It's time now for Greener Anglia, where we discuss the steps we're taking to create a way of travelling that's greener and more sustainable. I'm joined today by Steph Evans, our Environment and Energy Manager. Hi, Steph. We often say that rail travel is the most sustainable form of transport after walking and cycling. Why is that? So the new trains obviously play a really key part of it, mainly because they've got a lot of features that are beneficial to the environment. So to give you a few examples, they're aerodynamic in their design, so that can help us to reduce energy in terms of how much energy they're using compared to the old ones. They've also got regenerative braking on them, which means that they harness energy as they brake, and previously that would have been wasted. They've also got energy meters on them which means that we can then look to see trends if certain trains are using more energy if routes are using more energy and will help us to make further reductions and um, overall we've also got a bi-mode train and that means it has two power modes diesel and electric so if there are overhead lines available that can be utilized and to give you an example so if you're traveling from norwich to cambridge as you get to ely the pantograph can be raised and it means it can then utilize the power from the overhead lines and use electricity rather than diesel previously that whole route would have been diesel usage that sounds really good so so is it just about the new trains then is, is that why we're greener no so there's also lots of work being done with regards to station building there's been a big program of led installations for the lights to help reduce electricity consumption from those i've also been installing a wireless energy management systems at over 30 stations and these are basically a network of temperature sensors that help to regulate the temperatures in the station buildings and that can then help to reduce energy consumption and we've also installed water fountains at 12 stations which means the passengers have the opportunity to fill up the water bottle and that can help to reduce plastic waste which is hugely beneficial and i think at the last calculation we did over 400,000 bottles had been refilled which you know means effectively we've prevented that amount of waste overall wow that's quite something isn't it we've also we've installed lots of cycle spaces haven't we at stations so i suppose we're encouraging people to come to the station by another sustainable form of transport. Yeah, and I suppose that's the key thing as well. We don't want to just focus on travelling by train. It's also how do people get to the train station and want to make sure there's options out there to travel to the station sustainably as well. What about passengers? How are we helping them to do their bit? So we've got a Greener Angular page on the website and this can help passengers to decide whether their journey is um, greener by going by train so there's a carbon calculator on there which can help passengers to assess options yeah good point good point because i think that greener anglia hub also says how many cars are taken off the road if everybody travels on one of our intercity trains for instance and it's remarkable numbers how did you know that this was the right role for you you're doing so much to make greater anglia greener have you always been interested in green and sustainable issues so i was always interested in geography at school and i've always liked the outdoors and being outdoors so i suppose i really do genuinely care about the environment so it's not just although it is my job it's something i kind of do as well as a hobby just it's just i suppose my personal life that's what what i do and i think if everyone does their own little bit then we can all help to make a difference That's it from us for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed listening and learned something new about Greater Anglia. And as you might be realising, the world of train travel is huge and there's always more to discover. Life on Rails releases quarterly with the change of seasons, so be sure to check back in December for episode two.
In the meantime, though, follow or subscribe to the podcast for free so you never miss an episode. And visit our website at www.greateranglia.co.uk forward slash podcast for more information. Thanks for joining us. Bye.